So this evening, we're blessed to have the topic of the kingdom of God before us. And the speaker for tonight is Nicholas Perrin. Uh, I know Nick Perrin as my doctor father at Wheaton College. A uh, wonderful blessing to me to sit under him and learn for many years. He's a Covenant Theological Seminary grad. He earned his PhD at Marquette University. And today, he is the Franklin S. Durnis Chair of Biblical Studies at Wheaton College. He is also the pastor of Faith Community Church uh, in the Chicago land area. He's married to Cami. He has two grown boys, Nathaniel and Luke. And you may already know him as the author of The Kingdom of God. If you're taking, uh, if you're taking this whole course tonight, tomorrow, and Saturday, hopefully you already have a copy of uh, The Kingdom of God uh, by, uh, by Zondervan here recently. Uh, let me also introduce you to another book that Nick wrote, Lost in Transmission, question uh, mark. This is a great read. I used to use it with my undergraduate students. Uh, it's about what was the path from the historical Jesus and the things he said through the Jesus tradition to how it was written down in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then how have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John been transmitted over the years, and have the words of Jesus been lost in transmission, question mark. The thesis of the book is no, <laughs> right? They've been retained. So if you want to see how he argues for that, Lost in Transmission uh, is a book by Nick Perrin that I would recommend. And regarding the kingdom of God, we have 30% uh, discount codes here. Uh, I'll be sitting right over there during the break or so forth. I can give you one of these if you're interested in purchasing a copy of the kingdom of God. If you're taking uh, this course for credit, you already have a copy. Your reward is you already have a copy. And that's good for you. And you've already read some of it. You've already read some of it, right? Uh, Nick was converted, uh, not least in part, or rather shortly after his conversion. According to his testimony, he memorized, uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Uh, and so after years, even decades of meditating on the kingdom of God, we are the beneficiaries of all that study and learning tonight. So Nick, come on up. You're going to take over. And let me pray for us as I hand it over to you. Lord, we do give you thanks and praise because the kingdom of God has come near in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we pray now that we would do exactly as the voice on the Mount of Transfiguration said, listen to him. In his name we pray, amen. 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 Well, thanks, Nick, for the introduction. And, you know, for those of you who are connected with ITS, I assume that there's some people who are not here tonight, but if you are, uh, you have a rare gem in Dr. Piotrowski. Uh, it used to be that when I see him quoted in footnotes, I'd send him a quick picture of it, but now I gave up. That's just too, it's too often. He's, he is a major Matthew scholar, and uh, I, I look forward for, to him going to strength to strength and scholarship as time allows in the world of administration. But uh, so excited about the work of ITS and following it, and, uh, and bless you, brother, and, and the work that you do. And bless you guys connected with ITS. It's so, theological education is more important now than it has ever been in the life of the Western church. And a huge mistake that people are making uh, these days is to say, you know, oh, we got this. We, we don't need education. We don't go, need to go deep. And what happens is, uh, you know, you can get by going shallow for a while, but you live on a diet of going shallow, what happens is you end up with a shallow church. And I think that's uh, a little bit of what we're experiencing these days, is a lot of shallowness in how people are thinking, and therefore a lot of shallowness in how they're living. And so, brothers and sisters, I'm just saying, I think it's time that we go deep. <clears throat> Some of you will have uh, already read the, this book in preparation for the course. I know there's some people here taking the course for credit. Great, bless you. Uh, others, you just walked in tonight, you, you know, you decide not to go to the Indy 500 or whatever. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I've been told about this book, which came out this fall, uh, that it's not for the faint-hearted. I mean, there's some pretty deep concepts in the book. Uh, what I want to do tonight is do a couple things. I got a couple things on the agenda. One is to just raise the topic of the kingdom and to explain why the kingdom is such a crucial topic as, for followers of Jesus. Uh, secondly, I want to uh, 
put by hermeneutic out there. And by the word hermeneutic, hermeneutic is a highfalutin term meaning how I interpret scripture. And I think the way that I, I like to think the way I interpret scripture is how the New Testament writers interpret scripture and that this, that this way of interpreting scripture is faithful to the text. And it actually is a necessary mechanism for going deeper uh, at this stage of, of the church's journey. Uh, and, and thirdly, I want to get in the Gospel of Mark. So the first hour, I'm going to really drill down deep into one particular scene in Mark, and then we're going to spend the next two hours just zooming through the rest of the Gospel, focusing on a couple of th important themes. So that's the agenda. We'll take breaks. I hope, hopefully we'll get, sneak two breaks in there, one, one after the first hour, one after the second hour. And if you're still awake by quarter of 10, I'm, I'm good. All right? So uh, we're all prayed up, and now I just want to... I talk about the kingdom and why it's so important. The kingdom is the one thing that Jesus talks about more than anything else. Jesus talks a lot about money, uh, but Jesus talks about the kingdom far more. Now, what makes this interesting is that in my experience, and maybe this is your experience too, the kingdom is the, the one thing that Christians, Christ followers, feel pretty okay in terms of punting on it conceptually, right? And so, you know, so people throw this kingdom word around, you know, kingdom, I'm all about the kingdom, you're about the kingdom, great. But often what, what you find is when people use those words or when, when believers talk about the kingdom, we're not quite sure what we're really talking about. You know, so for the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the kingdom is very closely identified with the church. And yet, in the Protestant tradition, the kingdom is not one and the same as the church. Protestantism uh, alighted on what I think is an important and profound biblical truth, uh, of which we might call the invisible church, the church within the church. Because just because you walk through those doors Sunday by Sunday, it doesn't mean you're going to be with him on the final day. And if that's really true, then we have to think about circles, a circle within a circle, a kingdom within this other kind of corporate social reality. So uh, what I argue, part of what I argue in the book is the, the kingdom is this dimension that intersects with the church, but is not identical with the church. The church is, uh, let, me, let me use an uh, analogy because I was talking to someone during the break about tornadoes in Missouri. And uh, if, if the, the church is like the open field and the kingdom is like the tornado touching down, the kingdom needs a place to touch down, and the church is kind of like that. Um, but the kingdom doesn't necessarily uh, depend on us. God will do what God wants to do, and he's going to work the way he wants to work. So that's, uh, that's just a sneak peek in the way I'm thinking about the kingdom, and I think that's accurate to how the Bible presents the kingdom. The other thing I want to say about the kingdom is one common misconception about the kingdom is the kingdom is strictly something in the heart. And that is extremely common. And one of the theo theological figures that are, that's responsible for that conception of the kingdom is a German by the name of Schleiermacher. Back at the beginning of the 19th century, so this is a long time ago, early 1800s, Friedrich Schleiermacher uh, introduced a notion of spirituality that, and I'm going to take shortcuts here if that's okay, but that reduced spirituality to the sense of awareness and feeling, the feeling of absolute dependence. And this worked really well at, in Germany at that time and really well in England at that time because both because Western Europe was going through an intellectual movement called Romanticism. And what Romanticism is largely about is interior that is experienced inside of us. Now, of course, um, when we talk about religious experience or, or, or specific Christian experience, I hope, I hope there's an interior experience and that's real and that should be there. On the other hand, if we restrict the concept of kingdom to simply our feelings or an interior experience, I think that's uh, not just unbiblical, but it's very, very dangerous. 
Because what that means is if the kingdom is restricted to you as an individual or your experience of the kingdom, then what that means is there's no, ultimately no communion of that kingdom between believers. All we have is our individualized experiences. And more than that, it becomes very, very difficult to develop a worldview or an understanding of reality that lays claim to the public square. And the world, is the, the, the surrounding culture is very comfortable with Christians in that respect. Because if Christians just keep Jesus to themselves in their closets, we can all be happy, right? Like, you can do your thing, fine, just don't impose your morals on the public square. Just keep your religion to yourself. That's, that's, that's kind of the agreed upon terms of our Western liberal society. And what made that work really well was a sly mocking and understanding of the kingdom, which said, yeah, what between, what's between me and Jesus is just between me and Jesus, and I'm not going to take this conception of the kingdom and try to apply it to things like politics or the social order or, or, or issues like poverty or opioid addiction or, you know, fill in the blank. But if we're kingdom followers, what that means is we need a theology that's wide enough and robust enough to take on and to address these issues. And frankly, friends, if the Bible isn't big enough to speak to these issues, then maybe it's not worth reading after all, because these are real-life issues that we're all involved in. And uh, some people want to say the kingdom's all about this reality in heaven, and that's all that it's about. When you die, you'll go to the kingdom, but you can't experience the kingdom here. And, um, you know, the Western state just loves that. Because what that means is you, you can keep your religion a private thing, and you're not going to disrupt, like, the power structures of our current society. But when Jesus came, he was, he was very disruptive, not just to people's spiritualities, but to the social and political order, and that's one of the reasons he was crucified because he was a very disruptive figure. And the kingdom that he was talking about, everyone knew. It had very political implications. You'd have to be a theological expert to know that at the time. So in this course, what I'm going to do, and what, what I try to do in the book, which is some ways um, uh, the course is unpacking in the book, is explore that by going through the biblical texts. We'll let the text speak for itself, but you know, I see myself as like a tour guide through the Bible. And, I'm, and tonight's going to be a little bit different from the rest of the course for those of you taking the course, because uh, when we sit down for the course, it's going to be group interaction, and I'm going to want to hear your thoughts and your inputs. Tonight, because of the format, it's going to be a little bit more luxury, okay? And just as a forewarning, because I don't want you walking out tonight and say, hey, if I have to listen to that parent for the next three days, I'm, you know, <laughs> you're right. I just want you to know, as a little disclaimer, how it's going to look. But let's get into this, uh, this right away by turning to Mark chapter 1. So if you've got your Bibles on your phones uh, or wherever you carry your Bibles, go to Mark chapter 1, and I'll do that. And the gospel starts this way, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God. All right, so let's hit the pause there right away. So as Mark says, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Text critics aren't sure. By text critics, I mean people who compare manuscripts uh, of the original manuscript. They're not sure if the phrase Son of God is original, so I'm going to bracket that because we're not entirely sure whether that's original. And you should have a footnote that on that in your translation. But what we do know, what, what Mark wrote, was the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What's Mark doing when he's talking about the beginning? Well, if you're a Jewish reader and you hit that phrase, in the beginning, where does your mind go? But right back to Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And here comes Mark saying, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we see something, of course, very similar in the fourth gospel, the gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And of course, in Genesis chapter 1, that's where the Word was, was right in the beginning. 
Now, this is no coincidence, but what Mark is trying to do here is draw a comparison between the story he's about to tell and the story told in Genesis 1. The story told in Genesis 1 was a story of creation. The hint is, is that the story Mark's about to tell is sort of like that, but this is a story of new creation. As seismic as Genesis 1 obviously was, was, the creation of heaven and earth and everything that we know, as seismic as that was, you might say that Mark chapter 1 is signaling an even more seismic event, something bigger than creation itself. And that something bigger is this person called Jesus Christ, or Jesus Christos, the Messiah, the anointed one, the king. But it's not just the beginning of Jesus Christ. It's the beginning of the gospel or the good news. And the Greek word here is euangelion. So we, uh, you know, it's where we get the word evangelical. And what good news means is, is something that the church has been unpacking for 2,000 years. In the context of the gospel of Mark, Mark is writing to readers who know their scriptures really, really well. And, you know, when I say that, you say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, no, they really knew their scriptures really, really well. Uh, and partially because in the first century world, I mean, you weren't distracted by ESPN or newspaper or, or Facebook or Twitter. You know, you didn't have those distractions. You just, you got deep into the scriptures and told scripture stories. You sat around, and these, these were things you held on to. Uh, as you waited the Messiah. So uh, when you saw the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, you connected with Genesis in the first place, but you also think, th thought of this word gospel. Gospel, where does that occur in the Old Testament? Well, actually, the word, the noun, only occurs once in a pretty obscure place in the Samuel narrative, but the word euangelizomai, which is the verb form, means to gospelize, that occurs a couple places in Isaiah. How lovely on the mountaintop are the feet of him who bring good news. All right. Preach good news. Yoangalitzomai. What's the good news in the book of Isaiah? It's the news that Yahweh is taking the throne again. Yahweh is becoming king. And that's coordinated with another really important event in Israel's history, return from exile. What's Isaiah about, the book of Isaiah about? Well, at least from chapter 40 to 66, it's about Israel's return from exile. Israel had been disobedient because of their covenant unfaithfulness. They go into exile. Isaiah says, don't worry. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Why? Because your sin has been atoned for and you are coming back out of exile and this is declared to be good news. So when Mark opens his gospel, or as the beginning of the gospel, he's hinting that this has something to do with what's going on in Isaiah. It's a return from exile. It's a declaration of God finally becoming king. Now, that's, that might sound strange to you. Like, what do you mean God becoming king? Like, isn't he always king? And my answer to that is yes and no. Yes and no. On one level, God is always king because he's the creator God. We'll talk more about this tomorrow morning for those of you who are here. But there's another level uh, beyond the fact that God made everything, God is Lord of everything, in which in, in the Jewish worldview, you weren't really something until you functioned that way. So you weren't really... If you, you weren't really a dog unless you did dog things. Your car wasn't really a car unless it could drive. I had a car that wasn't really a car once. In order to really be something, in order to embrace your identity, you have to function that way. God isn't truly fully God until he's king. So there's a sense in which God becomes king. And you say, well, that sounds heretical. Well, read Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah 14 foresees a day when he says God will become king. And that's when the eschatological promises contained in the scriptures are cashed out. 
So the kingdom, what that implies about the kingdom is the kingdom of God is a dynamic process. It's an unfolding process. The kingdom is here, yet it's also arriving even as God is becoming king. So right away in the first five words of, of Mark's story, we're, we're flagged up that this is a new creation. This has something to do with return from exile. But there's something else we need to say about this word gospel, and that is the word gospel was pretty common in Roman parlance. Uh, and what I mean by that is the gospel, the proclamation of good news, had to do with Caesar's press conferences. All right? So, you know, you would think that Caesar uh, would not really worry about what people thought. Uh, the Roman emperors did worry about what people thought. They're very aware of how they're doing in the polls. Uh, because, you know, if your polls drop too much, people get a little edgy and disruptive, and so it's important. So part of what made things work in Caesar's day was Caesar would put out regular news bulletins, let's say, propaganda about how great Caesar was. All right? And so uh, what these bulletins were called were gospel. Good news. Good news. Caesar's won another victory up in Gaul. Good news. Caesar's had a boy. Uh, gave, Caesar's, one of Caesar's wives gave birth to a boy. It, fill in the blank. All right? But Mark's telling a story not about the gospel of Caesar, not of Tiberius and um, not of Augustus. This is the gospel of another king, and that's King Jesus. Okay, stop, hit the pause button right there. Because Mark is writing, I believe Mark is writing this, this story to Rome probably in the late 60s. And if you think about what's going on in Rome in the late 60s, Nero's in control, at least up until 68 when he committed suicide. And Nero's making life really difficult for the believers. How difficult? Well, he's arresting some, he's torturing others. Some he would put on post, paint with tar, and light them up for his garden parties. So the Christians were undergoing some pretty massive persecution, pretty serious persecution. And part of what I think Mark is trying to do with his gospel is he's trying to address the issue, uh, what we call theodicy, the justice of God. How, how could God be in control if all these awful things are happening? And now Mark, in the midst of it, at the very beginning of his story, is talking about this gospel that, let's just say mimics, but uh, destabilizes another gospel, and that is that Caesar's got everything under control. Mark's introducing another king. And when you introduce another king, when Caesar's used to being in control, guess what? That poses a problem, right? And, it, and so we have this competitor account of the universe. In the Roman ideology, Caesar was Pontifus Maximus. Roman emperors, uh, Augustus was the first Roman emperor. He really took control in the 20s BC, before Christ. But by 14 BC, he said, hey, you all, why don't you make me in charge of all things religious too, just to keep it clean? And they did. They made him the Pontifus Maximus, which means the great bridge to the gods. And when you were the Pontifus Maximus, your job was to please the gods. One way you do, do that is to keep the public order stable. All right? So that meant the whole world held, was held in Caesar's hand, Augustus's hand. And that's what the Romans believed, and that's what Augustus wanted the Romans to believe. It all worked together really well. But now Mark is saying, hey, there's somebody else who's actually in control, and that's this Jesus. So, so friends, what this means is you can't get past verse 1 of chapter 1 without drawing the conclusion that this gospel, this story of the kingdom, is deeply political. Because once you start saying, hey, there's this other king uh, around, and he's going to give Caesar a run for his money, you are making a deeply political statement. So sometimes, I say this because sometimes Christians will say things like this, and I, I've probably said it once or twice in my life, maybe more. You know, Jesus didn't come to bring a political kingdom, but a spiritual kingdom. How many people have heard that before? All right. Now, I don't necessarily disagree with that, but, but here's the thing. Here's the thing, is if you mean by that, that this kingdom of God is not supposed to impact 
the way we do politics, the way we shape society, the assumptions about how we treat each other, then that is just dead wrong. Now, if, if, what, and if what you mean is, well, you just stay inside your prayer closet, be nice, and that's, what the, that's how the kingdom takes effect, which is what you know, the message is sometimes, um, that's just dead wrong. But if you're willing to say that this kingdom that Jesus brings is spiritual and has political entailments, because this kingdom that Jesus brings is going to make an impact on the social fabric, is going to make an impact on the way we do politics, is going to make a way, uh, an impact on the way we live life in the city. Is, that's what the kingdom is for. So uh, to me, that's deeply exciting, because that means that Jesus has something to say to all these really crucial areas of our life. And what we, we have to do as responsible kingdom followers is do a theology of these things. And that circles back to why things like ITS are so important, because you know, if you lock me in the room with a Bible for a week, um, you know, maybe even a month, I'll just become a heretic. Like what I need is other people to set me straight, and I need to be in fellowship, and I need to, we need to study together, and we just need to go deeper on some of this stuff, so that we have a theology of urban life, we have a theology of racial reconciliation, we have a theology of, you know, again, fill in the blank. And this is all under the rubric of kingdom. All right, so uh, th- this is how Mark introduces the gospel. I'm going to come back to verses 2 and 3 in the second hour, but I want to s- run down to um, verse 9 and focus on the baptism. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. So here we have the introduction of Jesus in verse 9. He's come from Nazareth, and he's baptized by John in the Jordan. Now on the screen in front of you, you'll see uh, a peace sign. And uh, most of us have used the peace sign at one time or another in our lives. But the peace sign is a multi-layered symbol. So I'm going to digress a little bit and talk a little bit about the history of the peace sign. You ready for this? All right. The peace sign got started in the 1940s during World War II. So this is a, a radio announcer on BBC Radio in Belgium, on the Belgian wing. Hitler is taking control of Western Europe. And, I mean, you know, when the Nazis came in, when the Germans came in, they just rolled their way uh, very quickly into some major pockets of of political power of uh, Western Europe. And they were gaining territory very quickly. And it it had taken Western Europe by surprise, as well as Poland. And so what he says is, um, this announcer says, is as an act of resistance, maybe what we should do is make a V with our hands. And the, the V, why? For victoire, victory. We will have victory over the Germans. So this is, a, this is a slide from a road in Belgium where somebody just took chalk and said V as a way of resistance, as a way of saying victory is on the horizon. But we have to work together, pull together to establish victory. So there's a French family. Nazis have occupied France, but this is their way of showing resistance, showing that they believe that victory is going to happen. On the American side, V was also adopted uh, by various organizations, but the one who made it famous was Churchill, and, uh, and, and so he would walk around going like this. There, there's a scene in a recent Churchill movie where he goes like this and somebody straightens him out like, no, in England you can't go like this to people. That's not a good thing. All right, but you can go like this. So V for victory. So Churchill was really the one who popularized it. This is Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, when he wins his election, he goes, look, I'm victorious. Nixon does the same thing. He's got the V for victory sign. 
But what's happening too, uh, is in the Nixon era, slightly before, is the Vietnam era. And what happens is, is the victor, V for victory gets morphed into a different symbol meaning peace, right? Now, I remember this personally because when I was about five or six years old in, in the late 1960s, there was a janitor at our school named Tom, and uh, I mean, he was a true hippie. And he would go around and he would say to the kids, peace, baby. And that was his way of like, resisting the Vietnam War. And we go, peace, you know, back at him, right? And, and so, but you, you see the neological connection, because once you have victory, it establishes peace. So you, you, you see how that works together. So here are some Vietnam protesters, and when they use the sign, they're talking about peace. Well, now, when we get into the 1970s and 1980s with the revolution in, in Iran, uh, this is a, a protester who uses V for victory and peace, but not now also, it takes on the added edge of revolution. It's interesting, isn't it, how words and how even symbols can change. This is the Polish Solidarity Movement leader, resistance. Resistance, this is, you see the blood coming through that woman's mask, she's, she's from uh, Iran, it's Iraq, no, Iran, I'm sorry, Iran. And so here's, here's the thing, by the end of the story, uh, this sign means all these things at the same time, victory, peace, revolution, resistance, and you say, well, you know, what difference does that all make, where's that all going? Here's the thing, symbols can be complex realities. So when I go like this, you don't know what I mean. You don't know if I mean peace, resistance, victory. Maybe in a way I mean all those things. I say this because as I'm about to read Jesus' baptism, I see the baptism not just as a symbol, but as something that contains multiple stories. And I think that if we read the Bible carefully, we have to have our ears attuned to not just one story going on, but multiple stories. And the reason why I think this needs to be emphasized is sometimes... Uh, because we're post-enlightenment people, and the way enlightenment likes to think about processing knowledge is that we think that every code has only one meaning. Uh, and, and the reality is, is language is much more complex than that. Story is much more complex than that. Uh, the enlightenment, in order, because it's so scientific and wants precision, wants us to think of that, but it just isn't true. And, language, and philosophers of language are now agreeing that that's simply not true and no longer tenable. When we look at meaning in the text, often there's multiple things going on. I like to, and I, I hold to the plain literal sense of the text, and that's important, but there's other things going on at the same time. There's lots of stories in this, and then at the same time, there's lots of stories in that, in Jesus. Now, let me put it this way, too. I want to come back to the issue of language. On the left is a um, very famous painting. It's, it's actually in the Chicago or an institute. Um, and it's a Chagall. And uh, Chagall is one of my favorite artists, so I just put that in there. And, and, and it's one of my favorite pieces. And you can look at a Chagall, you can, or, or maybe you've got a other fa you know, favorite piece of art, and you can look at it. And then you can look at it the next day, and it looks different, right? Or maybe you look at the next week, and it looks different again, because that, that's how art works. It's, 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 if you look at it from different angles or from different times in your life, there's still a richness there, right? I mean, that's the way it works. Now, compare that with the, the sign on the right. Okay, the sign on the right, news bulletin here, isn't art. All right, now, okay, like during the break... I'm, there might be you know, bathrooms that are marked that way. If you saw me during the break and I, and I come up to the men's room door and it's right here, and I just see that sign and I go, wow, wow, just look at it from here. Just like, did you see, did you see what the artist is trying to do? Like you'd say, this guy's crazy, right? So the function of the sign on the right is to say, this is where you go to the bathroom, 
right? The, 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 art, the, the sign on the left is much more complicated than that. There's lots of things going on on the thing on the left. The right is just saying this is that. The left is multiple stories wrapped into one. What I want to do is get you to think of the baptism as multiple stories wrapped into one. I just read you the, the story of the baptism. Here's what's happening. Jesus comes from Nazareth and Galilee. He's baptized by John in the Jordan River. We'll, cut, we'll get back to John mo momentarily. Um, but here's the thing. Is there's messaging going on from heaven. Because if you look at the key verse here, the, the verse that describes what's going on, it's verse 11, a voice comes from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Now on one level, on just kind of surface level, we say, okay, so what, what's happening here is God is giving Jesus authorization. He's credentializing Jesus at his baptism. And that's true. And that's a dead obvious meaning of what's going on here. And if you get nothing else out of that text, you still win. But there's other levels of what's going on, I'd suggest. And the way I think about this is, is go back to what I said earlier, and that is the informed reader of the New Testament has also been informed by the Old Testament and lives in those Old Testament stories. And when the voice from heaven says, you are my son, whom I am well, with you am I am well pleased, it, it's a call out. It, it, it's a takeoff on a familiar trope that goes back to Psalm 2, verse 7, where it's said of David in that psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. We might also think of 2 Samuel 22, verse 20. And this is also David basically singing about what his experience of God. God brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. So I draw your attention to the words, you are my son and delighted in me. And look how close that is um, with uh, Psalm 2. Today I've become your father. With you I am well pleased. What that means is, the voice from heaven is connecting to Psalm 2 for a reason. Psalm 2 is a coronation psalm. It's about King David becoming king. And he becomes king on Mount Zion. Jesus, when he's getting baptized, so the voice from heaven seems to imply, is becoming king. Is being set apart as king in the manner that David was king. David was the great king. He was the king par excellence in Israel's history. David had all this going on. But I just don't see an allusion to David. I see an allusion to someone else. And here I think about Moses. So Reverend Charles Anderson's here. I'm preaching at his church on Sunday on Moses. Moses is a huge figure in the Old, Old Testament. For the Jews, because Moses was the redemptor par excellence. He brought Israel out of Egypt. Now, I'm giving you a little Greek there on the right. You are my son, whom I love. And Moses, when he approaches Pharaoh, says this. This is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. And he uses the word prototokos in the Septuagint. That's the Greek Old Testament. And you say, uh, I'm not sure where you're going with this. Let me explain this, though. The word agapetos uh, in Greek means beloved. But it's also interchangeable in Hebrew with the concept of being the firstborn. So prototokos means firstborn. Very closely, conceptually closely to agapetos. What that seems to say is that there's something going on between the baptism and Israel, between Jesus and Israel. And you think about it, what happens right after the baptism? He's tempted. Just as, what, who, who was tempted in the d desert 40 years? Uh, who, oh, Israel, right. 
You, you, so you see what's going on here is even at his baptism, Jesus is being identified with the people of God. And just as Israel had to go through this testing period, and, and how did they do? Not so good, right? Jesus goes through the testing period, and he passes in flying colors, right? What's the point of all that? Not to show that, not just to show that Israel can beat up on Satan, that's part of it, but to show that Jesus is true Israel. Who's the true people of God? The Jews want to think, well, our community is. We're, we're the Jews. I mean, we're the real deal. And all those other people, that you know, they, they don't have it like what well, we have it. And part of what Mark's laboring to do, and all, in fact, the whole New Testament is laboring to do, is like, look, you are not the remnant just because you're Jews. You contain the remnant in within you, and that remnant, his name is Jesus. He's the true Israel within you. So, yes, Israel contained true Israel within its midst, and that was Jesus. The other thing I want to say in this connection is, is this. In the Greek here, in this baptism it's seen, it says that Jesus came out of the water, that's the English, and in the Greek it's ektu hedatos, for those of you who know Greek. There's only one other place in the whole Greek Old Testament where that phrase shows up, and that's with Moses. Moses is drawn where? Out of the water. Moses came out of the water. Jesus came out of the water. Now, you say, okay, well, wait a minute. Can you, he both be Israel and Moses? And I say to you, it can't be any other way. And here's why. Let me introduce you to the concept of corporate personality. Corporate personality is a strange concept for those of us who've lived in the West our whole lives. It is not so strange to most every other part of the world. And, and here's how it works is what's true for the king is true for the people. I mean, even in the West, you know, there's a story about Queen Victoria. She didn't have a sense of humor back in the 19th century. You know, she always, you always see pictures of her. She's kind of scowling a little bit. And with Queen Victoria, when you told a joke, she would say, the queen is not amused, which means that no one's supposed to be amused. If the queen's not amused, you don't laugh at the joke either. So <laughs> just, I'll tell you a quick story on the side. This is, a, I think it's a funny story. Um, this is a story that Tom Wright told me. Uh, and he had, Tom Wright's a, a, a theologian who is in the UK, and I worked with him for a number of years. And he has a story where he was at the Queen's table and, uh, with about 10 other people. And they had this, this lovely dinner. And then it was dessert time, and they bring out this big lemon cake for dessert, and they show it to everybody. And the queen goes first. She makes, she, you know, she puts the order in her first because she's the queen. And she goes, no, thank you. And the person on her right says, no, thank you. And then the person next to them says, no, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. No, th comes to Tom, right? And he says, ah, oh, the piece. <laughs> you don't do that. If the queen turns down dessert, you turn down dessert. But, you know, here's what she did. This shows how much class she has. So then she changed her mind. Well, on second thought, I'll have a piece. 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 <laughs> that table is so thankful to have Tom right at their table. <laughs> Cute story, right? But it ex perfectly explains corporate solidarity. What's good for the king is true of the people. The king embodies the people, and the people are embodied in the king at the same time. So if Jesus is, is, stands in for Israel, he also stands in for Moses. But here's the other thing that Jesus does. Jesus in the Gospel of Mark leads a great exodus. Moses started the exodus. Jesus is here to finish the exodus. And that's, that's what Mark's trying to say. We will unpack that uh, later on this evening, God willing. All right, so one more piece. Genesis 22 is a really important scripture for Jews. I think this, the voice from heaven is connecting with Genesis 22 as much as anything. And now, um, when you read commentaries on Mark 111, you almost always will not get this, but this is now changing, I think, in recent scholarship. Because I think what, what's going on here is people are beginning to see the importance of Genesis 22, first lexically. Take your son, whom 
I love, or this is my son whom I love. And then what happens in Genesis 22? God sh shows up to Abraham and says, Abraham, take your son, and you need to kill him. And this all happens on Mount Moriah, three days journey. He walks Isaac up the mountain. Isaac said, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham knew he was looking at the sacrifice. And an angel intervened. When God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, in the Greek of the, old, of the Septuagint, it says ta agapetan, the exact same word that we have here, whom you love. Here's the other thing. Where does the voice come from in Mark chapter 1? It comes from heaven. In the Greek, it's ektu oranon. In Genesis 22, where does the voice come from that stops the whole thing? Ektu oranon, from the heavens. In fact, you have stronger lexical support for a correspondence between Genesis 22 and the baptism account than any other Old Testament passage. Maybe some, too. It's a tie. And you say, well, why? Why would Mark be interested in drawing that together? Or why would the heavenly voice want to connect those two dots? And I'll explain this. Here's why. It's because Isaac was also a great hero of the faith. Now, I don't, when you know that, when you hear the story of the Akedah, the, the great test, when Abraham brings Isaac up on the mountain, when you hear that, you might be tempted to think that Isaac doesn't know what he's getting into. That he's kind of going, to, hey, hey, Dad, what's that big knife for, Dad? You know, and, and he, we might think he's just oblivious to what's happening, but that's not how Jews of the first century thought of it. They thought of Isaac being a full grown adult being fully aware that he's about to be sacrificed, and he says, if this is what Yahweh wants, then I'm going to do it, which makes him a hero. Here's, here's the thing. Now we, now we see the obvious core connection between what Jesus is going to accomplish on the cross and Isaac, but here's the thing. Why is Isaac an important figure? Because uh, this was an important test. God comes to Abraham and puts him in a test. The Greek word is parasmos. If you're, if you're taking notes, it's P-E-I-R-A-S-M-O-S. It means trial or test. God tested Abraham by saying, I want you to sacrifice your son. That same word, test, is used in Mark's gospel in Mark chapter 14 when he's in Gethsemane. And Jesus is in the biggest test of his life. The test is, is, is he going to stay faithful? Is he going to go to the cross? Is he going to sacrifice himself? Now, what, here's something else that's interesting. In Genesis 22, right before Abraham is about to cut into Isaac, Isaac calls out to his father. He says, Father, does anyone remember what Jesus says in Gethsemane in Mark chapter 14? Abba, Father. The exact same word in the Greek Bible. Jesus is recapitulating the Isaac story. He's the new Isaac. Why is that important? One, because it means that Jesus is embracing his fate as a sacrifice required by God. Two, because in Second Temple Judaism, when they looked to Isaac and they, uh, they wanted an account of how the t temple sacrificial system worked, you know, they, you know, they cut open some animals and the blood and like, how does all that work? And the Jews said, this is simple. It's not about animal blood. The basis for all this is what Isaac did many, many years ago. When he willingly gave his life, he became the foundational sacrifice for all su su subsequent sacrifices. By introducing Jesus as the new Isaac, God, and Mark by extension, is saying Jesus is now the foundation of a whole new temple system where Jesus is, is that figure. So when we look at the vo heavenly voice, we're seeing a lot of things going on here. We're seeing three stories, at least. I've rolled Israel into Moses. But we see the story of David, the great 
king, shepherd king. We see the story of Moses, the great redeemer, and we see the story of Isaac, uh, the sacrificial figure who provided atonement. Mark promises, I think, a story in which Jesus is going to prove himself as all three at once. He's, take, he's taking these three thre threads, and he's saying Jesus is like David. How is he like David? Well, first of all, David was a warrior king. Jesus is a warrior king. If you don't believe me, think about this. Think about the David story. David is anointed in 1 Samuel chapter 16. He's anointed king, but it, does he become king yet? No, he's got to go through a long waiting period because Saul is holding on to the kingship. It's not Saul's kingship anymore, but officially it is, but not in God's eyes. Jesus is anointed. Does he become king right away? No, he's got to work for it. He's got to wait it out. What happens right after um, David is anointed? Well, he, he takes on Goliath that evil enemy of Israel. What happens after Jesus is anointed? He takes on Satan, the great evil enemy of Israel. Well, after David and Goliath fight, what happens next? He goes to Abimelech and has to eat the bread and run, and because Saul is after him. He's in major, major conflict. What happens in Mark chapter 2 through chapter 3, verse 6? five episodes of escalating conflict with the Jewish leaders. What does this all prove is that David is this warrior king who will eventually have victory. Jesus is the same warrior king. But at the same time, David's the restorer. Israel of the first century knew that there would be future David coming, and he would restore the tribes and bring them back to a unified whole. It says that in Ezekiel chapter 34 through 37. The promise of an eschatological David who's going to bring it all together. When would this happen? At the return from exile. This is a point that hardly gets talked about and just needs much more attention. The role of the reintegration of the 12 tribes of Israel. When Israel went to exile, I mean, tribe of Joseph, the you know, tribe of Dan went here, Naphtali went there. They, they all scattered. But the prophets are very, very clear that when the return from exile occurs, the 12 tribes are going to be reintegrated. Return from exile is not complete until there's unity. That fast forward to John chapter 17, when Jesus prays before the Father, he prays that they may be one as you and I are one. The basis of all that, I believe, is Jesus knew his scripture. And he knew that the end of exile was complete when all of the tribes, all God's people, which by now includes the Gentiles, because the tribes, were, the northern tribes had intermarried with the Gentiles, had come together in unity under one shepherd with one flock, as it says in John chapter 10. One of the reasons why it's so important for Christians to love one another, one of the reasons why we have to keep working at breaking down the barriers that separate our, our fellowships is because it brings return from exile to completion. We're still, as long as we have the barriers, and we do, and in some ways we need to, but, we're on a pro but we don't stop there. We're on a process that seeks to return from exile. That's the David's job, is to bring all the tribes together. Again, I'll direct you to Ezekiel 37. I, I don't have time to lay that all out. But the other thing about David is he suffers an awful lot. And if you don't believe me, then you haven't read your Psalms lately. Uh, David suffers greatly. And of course, Jesus suffers greatly. Jesus is our great sufferer. The kingship was his, but he had to suffer to get it. And that's also true of David. This is actually one of the most important points in the Gospel of Mark, is getting straight the concept of kingship. You know, for me, I just like life pretty easy. I want to th think that I'm going to stand beside my king, and uh, it's going to be easy. I'm going to waltz my way there. But on Jesus' logic, on the Gospel logic, we get there through a trail of tears, through suffering. That's the only way. 
This king is a strange king. And if you follow this strange king, he's going to ask you to take on your kingship in a strange way through suffering. We've seen that before in the David story. Well, what about Moses? Well, like I said, Moses was a great redeemer. Jesus is the great redeemer. Moses led the children of Israel out. Jesus is leading his disciples out. We'll explore that more the next hour. But here's the other thing about Moses is he gave the law. He gave Israel a new code. But Jesus is doing the same thing. So Dr. Piotrowski, you should try to read his dissertation someday. It's published in a very prestigious dissertation series. And he foc Dr. Piotrowski focuses on the first four chapters of the Gospel of Matthew, explaining how important return from exile is to Matthew the Evangelist. But it's interesting as we come into Matthew chapter 5 with the first verses, Jesus goes up on a mountain, sits down, and he gives these three chap beautiful chapters we know as the Sermon on the Mount. Who else goes up on a mountain and sits down and gives instruction? Moses. When Jesus goes up there, he's, he's acting like a new Moses. Right? So he's doing, how is he functioning? As the lawgiver. Well, what about Isaac? I think there's two things we want to say about Isaac. Is he provided atonement as far as Israel was concerned. It wasn't ultimately animals. All that was based on this figure called Isaac. Jesus is going to do the same thing. Jesus comes to bring atonement. But the other thing we need to say about Isaac is he was the heir. Here's the way I say that. Because we have to go back to Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 15, God makes a covenant with Abraham, and then again in 17. God makes a covenant with Abraham, and he says, all nations will be blessed through you, sort of, but really through your seed. Your seed will be the source of blessing. And all the nations are going to converge in your seed. Now, Paul tells us in Galatians that the seed is Jesus Christ. But on another level, who, who was the seed of Abraham? It was Isaac. So when you read the Second Temple Jewish literature outside the Bible, books like Jubilee, books like One Enoch, Isaac plays a major, major role because he was expected to be the heir of the universe. Everything would come back to him. Now, we'll explore that later on tonight. But if, Jesus, if Isaac was expected to be the heir, and Christ is the new Isaac, it means Jesus is the heir of this whole universe. It's all going to Jesus. So we got lots of roles here. And this is all surrounding Jesus the Messiah. It's amazing, isn't it? So these three stories just carry so much cargo. And why, here's, why, here's one of the reasons why I'm stressing this tonight is because I want to introduce you to, uh, to I want to encourage you to read Scripture deeply. And when you come to verses, I want you to look for resonances of familiar stories and then just say, hey, that just sounds like somebody else, but then ask why. It connects with Elijah or Moses or fill in the blank, okay? That's what doing biblical theology is about. It's about one story. The kingdom story isn't a New Testament thing. It isn't even just a Jesus thing. The kingdom preceded Jesus by centuries. Jesus just brought the kingdom to a climax. So when we talk about the kingdom, when we get together on Sunday morning and saying, I'm all about the kingdom... That's great, but know when you're saying that, that you're, taking, you're getting on a train that has been running since Genesis chapter 1. We're a part of something really huge that's going to have an impact on, our, on not just the cosmos and not just people's souls, but the communities that we live in as we're faithful. And, and here's the amazing thing is when you look at all the roles that Jesus takes on, and he does take on these roles, right? 
And he probably takes on these roles at different points in your life at different times. There's times for me when I need Jesus to save me. Like, you know, when I look at my sin, and I say, man, I just I can't believe how much grip sin has on me. Jesus, just redeem me. Or I need to know, like, this is all going somewhere, because sometimes I worry about that. You know, where's all this going? And that Jesus is the heir, and that he's, he's got this all covered. But sometimes I need Jesus to be my warrior and fight my battles for me when I'm, when I'm not in a political position to, to stand up for myself. I say, Jesus, can you be my warrior? We need Jesus to put in our own lives to play all those roles for us as individuals. Uh, as churches, we need Jesus to take, put on different hats for us at different times. When we preach the gospel to people, I think the shrewd communicator says, what kind of Jesus does this person need right now? And then when you, once you've answered that question, take the story in that direction. You know, you know the gospel isn't just some, a bomb that you just drop on everybody all at the same time. It's a story that can be unfolded in different ways. And so if we are missiologically sensitive it means that we've got to get in touch with the many ways that Jesus is presented um, and to just be willing to connect with people on that level and to share from our experience and say, you know what? Jesus is these seven things at least. And that's, it's almost an arbitrary list, guys, but I think it's a good start. And so we can't just narrow ourselves to this one like, information bit that we drop on people. What we have to do is like get ready Say, people, get ready for a story. And let me lead you in this story. And this story is contained in kernel form in Jesus' baptism. And when you think about it, you see Jesus make his own V sign up there. And that, when you think about it, it's a story of victory, peace, revolution, and resistance all at the same time. When, when, when Jesus came, he was doing all those things just like our V sign, all at once. And we have to let Jesus wear those hats, and we have to let Jesus wear those stories. And just the last thing I want to say before we break is this is a, this is a picture of a tree outside a window on a fall day. And that tree is all yellow, but sometimes trees can be a little red, a little yellow, a little green. And sometimes you just got to get outside of the room and walk around the tree and see its diversity, and see its beauty, and that's kind of like the way Jesus is, and that's the way the kingdom is. It's a kingdom of many colors. It's a Jesus who wears many different hats, and I think in order to really appreciate Jesus, what we've got to do sometimes is get outside of the confines of our room and just go deep with each other and say, okay, if, if this is what Mark, this Jesus Mark wants to present to us, if this is the Jesus the New Testament wants to present to us, then let's explore it together. Let's, let's, kind of, let's do our biblical theology, and then once we got that, we can share it with a world who so desperately needs this Jesus for different reasons. In Mark 1, it, says, it doesn't waste much time. Before John's preaching the kingdom, and uh, Jesus is preaching the kingdom. And, um, you know, I think when modern Christians read that, maybe we think something like, okay, so he's going to explain to people, Jesus is going to explain to people that He's going to go to the cross. We have to put our faith in him. He's going to get resurrected. And I think, no, it's probably not what Jesus did because that wouldn't make sense to people. And, and from everything we can tell in the Gospels, it's an unfolding story about the cross, right? But he's still preaching the kingdom. You go, well, how does that work? Because like I'm used to, like with the Gospel, I'm used to thinking, just go to the cross and the resurrection and justification and and Jesus was preaching the gospel, but he, he probably had this other story going on. And that's the story of the kingdom. So, uh, I mean, you think about that, how interesting that is? So, so that means like, we have to like, be open to expanding our notion of what the gospel is. You've got to be careful. Like, be careful when I say that. Um, I, I won't be taken out of context here, okay? <laughs> uh, but there's different ways of talking about God's activity in our midst. Now, you, and you can't get away from the cross and the resurrection. That's the bottom line. But, but the gospel is also about more than that. And there's a kind of bigger story in which those two pivotal events are situated. So, um, but when Jesus talks about the kingdom, the, he wasn't introducing a brand new term. 
because we already have kingdom language in the book of Daniel and other texts like the Psalms of Solomon, which is a first century BC text. And so people, when they thought kingdom, they thought that uh, they thought back to the promise made to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where God said to David, uh, your son, uh, you will always have a seed on the throne, and this will be the kingdom. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. So the Jews of Jesus' time, when they heard the term kingdom, they already had preconceptions as to what that was. Part of what Jesus is doing is building on that. Part of what he's doing in the course of his ministry is deconstructing their assumptions. So there's a little bit of both. There's continuity and there's discontinuity between Jesus' vision of the kingdom and the reigning Jewish understanding of the kingdom. So, um, but that's what the course is about, is, is exploring that. So for, I'll say a little bit about Rudolf Boltmann. Rudolf Boltmann was probably uh, in the top three most important New Testament scholars of the 20th century, and very influential. And his notion of the kingdom was something like this, is that when Jesus came preaching, he came as a Jewish prophet, uh, but he was, he was offering a kingdom that didn't really have to do with the Jewish dream at all, not with the national or social dream. What Jesus was doing was confronting his hearers with the necessity of making a decision, of choosing. And what Boltmann's doing is he's building on uh, Kierkegaard, an existentialist thought, which says our humanity is predicated on our ability to make decisions. And I think there's some truth to that. Right, so like it's it's character is, pr is proven through your decision making faculty. So Boltmann wanted to say, you know what, the kingdom is about uh, this reality that's ever present to us. Boltmann did not believe in the end of the time space continuum. He said he always thought reality is going to go on as it ever will be, but the kingdom is always kind of right there, and we just have to respond to it like this. And um, here's what I like about Boltmann is that Boltmann really grasped the necessity of decision. Because I think, and I think we've lost some of that. When, when it comes to Jesus, Jesus is constantly confronting people with the necessity of making up your mind. You've got to decide. You've got to choose. And sometimes we, we kind of, that gets lost in, in our translation somehow, where, well, Jesus is always there for you, and whenever you're ready for him, he's ready for you. And it's like, now, you know, that's, Jesus never said that, <laughs> right? Jesus is, is always throwing down the gauntlet and always putting people in uncomfortable situations that more or less forces the issue. He's constantly doing that. Um, you know, so Boltmann, I think Boltmann really grasped that. Otherwise, there's a lot of radical elements to what Boltmann's got going. Boltmann did not believe in the resurrection. He didn't, he didn't believe that Jesus was God. He didn't believe... Um, in the Jewish concept of Messiah. He wanted to disconnect uh, the story of redemption from Israel's story. Uh, and then at the end of the day, Boltmann is ultimately docetic, meaning he, there's nothing creational about Boltmann's theology. And, and, and th that's part of a wider trend in European theology, want, which wants to sever Jesus from the story of Israel. Part of what drives that is anti-Semitism, Part of what drives that is an embarrassment over the Old Testament in general. Part of what drives that is an uncomfortability with textuality, not sexuality, textuality. And what I mean by that is ro the romantic drive, and that's very strong in our culture today, does, it feels very uncomfortable when texts tell them what to do. I'll tell me what to do. How I feel is what will tell me what the norm, norming norm is. It's my, it's, it's, and have you ever been in a conversation, and to prove this, this would be really easy, have you ever been in a conversation with somebody on an ethical issue, and they say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I say, okay, well, good. Well, so let's, and they end up talking about this issue, and they say, well, that's not right. Well, I said, well, the Bible clearly says this is the way it is. Well, well yeah, but that's, it can't be because that's not the way I feel about it. And that's, if it's the way I feel about it, end of discussion. And it's just, it just doesn't feel right. So, I, I mean, I'll, I'll grade student papers where I get that. And I, I like, how can I argue with your feelings? But give me an engaged critical argument with the Bible, and then we can talk. 
right? But that, what, what, what's going on there is romanticism. When, when our, in my inner feelings and how I feel about something is the final word, that's, that's just where we are in our culture today, you know? Uh, and it's, and Boltman was right there, and we have to confront that in the church and say, what, what's the source of our truth? Is it the word of God, or is it how I feel about something? Um, so that's it, all right? All right, so any more questions? Time for one more. All right, so let's go, to go back to Mark chapter 1, and... Um, Let's go back to the beginning. So um, Mark introduces this gospel, and we already covered verse 1, but then he kind of unpacks verse 1 by going to verse 2 and 3. So here's what he says, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. I draw your attention to the as it is written, or maybe some English translations have just as it is written. In the Greek, for you Greek readers, it's kathos, right? exactly as it's written, which seems to suggest verse 2 and 3 are unpacking verse 1, that, that this, these verses from Isaiah plus are unpacking this gospel. And in, in verse Mark 1, verses 2 and 3, we have this reference to these, these, this way, this way in the wilderness. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way. And when you read the gospel of Mark, I know some of you who are taking the class, I asked you to read the gospel of Mark. Next time you read the gospel of Mark, Take a highlighter if you're one of those people who writes in your Bibles. Honestly, I'm not, but if you are, highlight the word way every time it shows up in the Gospel of Mark, and you'll be surprised how many times. In Mark chapter 2, the disciples are making their way through the grain fields. Jesus talks about selling seeds by the way, next to the way. Blind Barnabas is, um, in Mark chapter 10, he's calling out to Jesus beside the way at the beginning of, the, of that section. But by the time he becomes a believer, he's on the way. What's the way mean? The way is the return from exile. It's the way out of exile. I know how many of you have been to the Holy Lands, and if you have, if you've been to Jericho. Um, but when you go to Jericho, right on the main street of 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 ancient Jericho, when you're standing on it, you're standing on the way. Because archaeologists can basically reconstruct literally the way from Assyria to back to Israel. And here's, here's how we do it, is because you, you follow the ridges of the mountains. Yeah, when you're walking that kind of distance, hundreds and hundreds of miles through the desert, you want the fastest way, Right? You know, Siri, give me the fastest way. Yep. And, and that, <laughs> you don't go up and down the hills. You say, is there a line of ridges on top of the hills that will get me there? And in fact, there is a kind of a long ridge, you know, uh, not too far from, the, from Mesopotamia, where you can follow it all the way into Israel, and it goes right through the middle of Jericho. When Jesus enters Jericho on the way to Jerusalem, he is symbolically walking on the little geographical way return from exile that Isaiah talked about. Because he's what he's symbolizing. I mean, you know, it's, it's, interest, it's interesting how the gospel writers are very attentive to geographically where Jesus is. And there's a reason for that. It's because he, they want to make clear the reader knows that these movements are significant. And when he's, Jesus enters Jerusalem via Jericho, Mark chapter 10 for the ent royal entry in Mark chapter 11, it's a way of saying he's coming along the way. He's on the way out of Isaiah, just as it's prophesied in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. When he has a whole group of people following him, it's the return from exile picture, right? So he's parabolically living out, embodying what he wants people to understand about his ministry is he's the fulfillment of what Isaiah was talking about. Now, here's the deal with exile. Exile 
was what was put in place because of Israel's disobedience. Exile meant the dissolution of the tribes. But God always promised a return from exile. Isaiah promises a return from exile. And when that return from exile comes about, it means the kingdom of God is here. It's these, and that's what happens in the last chapter of Isaiah. God takes his throne, and he's, he's the king. So that's, that's important because when you talk about the coming of the kingdom, the other side of the coin is saying return from exile. Say, okay, so what? Well, here's a couple so what's. When Israel went into exile, what it meant is a loss of political sovereignty. They were no longer the boss. God's people weren't calling the shots anymore. The pagans were calling the shots. And whatever the pagans made for laws, you had to live with it. Whatever, you know, whatever the, the unbelievers said you have to do, you have to do. That's what life in exile is about. When the wrong people are in power, that's a life in exile. Are we living a life in exile? Oh, yes, we are. We are still coming out of exile. So Jesus came to start the process of return from exile, but the promise is there will be a day when the dream is fulfilled and when God's people will politically, socially, economically, spiritually, the whole caboodle be restored from exile. What that means is we need a return from exile theology that's robust enough and broad enough to encompass all those realities and to help us negotiate this life in between that we're all living. Right? Um, so so that's, that's part of the importance of return from exile. Here's the other kind of payoff is that when Israel came back from exile, what was the point? The point was so they go back to the land. What was so special about the land? Was it because they liked the way the, you know, the fruit grew there? Well, maybe. But it was so you go back to the sacred space. And why do you have to be at the sacred space? So you can run the temple. Because Israel's calling, we already saw it in Exodus, in Exodus chapter 4, Israel's calling is just basic. Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my son go that they might do what? Worship me. God, the function of God's people is not to live for themselves. It's not to live for their own self-interest, and that's where Israel didn't get the memo. They thought that God's favor was a license for it's all about us. And sometimes Christians can do the same thing. It's never been all about us. It's about worship. And our main task, our main reason for being alive, as the French would say, our raison d'etre, reason for being is worship. So for those of you who go to this church, when you're here Sunday morning, what, what, what time are services? 10.30. 10, when you're here at 10.30 a.m., you are never more fully fulfilling your function than when you're sitting in the seats. It's not just like, you know, some people see worship as, well, that's what I do on the weekends, like a side gig. No, it's like the main gig, and the rest of your life is an, is an outcome of the main gig. We were designed primarily for worship. There's no higher, higher calling. And so what that means very practically is when you come to worship, like I sometimes do, and say, well, I don't like the music today. Or, well, I don't know if that sermon does it for me. You know, or whatever. When we're kind of this critical mindset, and we're saying, what am I getting out of it? Well, you know, when you ask, even when you ask the question, what did you get out of it? It's the wrong question. The question is, what did you give God? Because that's, that's what worship is. It's all about... So we're, our job here uh, is the same thing as Israel's job. They want to get back to the land to, to worship God and fulfill their role as kingdom of priests. And, and, and so, again, the implication is, you know, when American Christians think that being a Christian is like their side gig or their private gig, they're missing it. Because it's like, you know, you know your, our primary identity is to be a priest in the kingdom and everything else is window dressing compared to that. So until we embrace that identity, we will continue to lose people from the church because they will see more potent visions for their lives. And they'll, they'll be entranced by those potent visions, but they're ultimately misleading. And so what we need is a gospel and a vision for life that's in keeping with the Bible, 
and, and, and fires, and like if we really knew what we're called to, we'd say, why am I fooling around with that stuff? You know, if I'm spend, why am I spending hours on Facebook when I should be, you know, I could be in worship, the true guy, you see? So, um, so, so, so Mark lays out this vision, call, brings in Isaiah, but if you look closely at verses 2 and 3, there's some, something else going on here. You also see hints of Exodus 24 and Malachi chapter 3. Because Malachi chapter 3 talks about this coming messenger. Um, before, behold, I send my messenger before your face. That's right out of Malachi chapter 3 and 4. We don't, ha- we don't have time to go there, but let me give you the shortcut on this. In Malachi chapter 3 and 4, this is one of the last Old Testament books written before the time of the coming of Jesus. It's, and it's the 5th century, and things are a mess. The priests are not doing their thing. They're misbehaving. No one's tithing. Um, people are um, divorcing their spouses right and left. Uh, sound familiar? I don't know. So anyway, um, here's what's happening. is like the culture's just falling apart. And God says, I'm going to send my messenger. And that begins to look an awful lot like John the Baptist, who we'll see in the next couple of verses. But here's the thing. It's like the, the point of the messenger was to prepare the way for offerings in the context of Malachi chapter 3. And again, it's the same idea. To prepare God, God's people, to do worship. And the last thing is, prepare, is that he will prepare your way before your face, and this is the same promise made to Israel during the Exodus, that God would go before the face of Moses and during the Exodus. And so we see these three storylines of Isaiah, return from exile, Malachi, restored worship, and and Exodus converging once again uh, in these verses. This is a hint that what Mark's going to write about when he writes about Jesus is return from exile, the restoration of right worship, and um, this exodus. So now John appears in verse 4, and he's baptizing the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, let me ask you guys, like, you know, if you wanted to start something big um, and get people's attention, you know, maybe what you do is you say, yeah, you know, I'm going to start a church, and this church, and I'm going to start this church in a place where everyone can see it. I'm going to put it on like 465, or it means 65, I don't know, is that a visible place? And it's, it's going to be, you know, seeker sensitive, or, and it's going to be visible, and people are going to come. And uh, here comes John the Baptist, and, you know, we don't read about this here, but in Mark, Matthew chapter 3 and Luke chapter 3, you know, the people come, and what does he say in a seeker sensitive way? Oh, you brood of vipers. <laughs> Who warned you of, of the coming wrath? So John rates pretty low on the seeker sensitivity scale. And it wasn't very strategic in that, you know, you're supposed to make church in a place where it's easy to get to, but John's out in the Judean wilderness. And if you've ever been there, that's out there. I mean, there's no water. There's nothing. You're, t- you're almost taking a risk walking out there from a heat stroke. So what? What's going on there? Why would John be in the wilderness? Maybe I'll ask you guys, take a, take a poll of all of you. What, why would John? I mean, it's not a very strategic place. Would you agree with me? If you're trying to get a following, um, why would he be in the wilderness? Okay, go on, Charles. Yeah. There could have been more strategic places for John to go, but he said, I'm going to embody what was the story that was happening to show it's now taking place. Israel, after the Exodus, went where? In the wilderness. By baptizing people in the wilderness, here's what John is saying is new Exodus. The first one didn't quite take. This one's for real. And it starts with John the Baptist. And he's baptizing people with water. Now, New Testament scholars debate this, but here, here's my take on this. One thing, well, one thing we know for sure is when John the Baptist 
applied water to people. He was not doing what the folks at Qumran were doing. You know, the Dead Sea Scroll community? So there was a community out in the Judean wilderness, and we know they dip themselves in water twice a day uh, in what are called mikvot or, or baths. A little kind of step down the steps, get in the water, come back out. Terribly unsanitary, by the way. John was not doing that. What they were symbolizing in the Dead Sea Scroll community was just a way of cleansing themselves before God on a daily basis. This is a one-time baptism. What John's saying is, if you're going to join my community, you're going to be baptized, and here's what it means. It means conversion. I'm converting you to Judaism. You go, what? Wait, okay, but only Jews are there, right? I said, yeah, but he's converting them to Judaism. Well, 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 how do you know that? Well, one thing I just told you in Matthew chapter 3 and Luke chapter 3, he calls them brood of vipers. Why does he say that? Because he can't think of a better insult? No, because he's connecting it with Genesis chapter 3, with the serpent. And he's basically saying, you're descendant from Satan. And if you're descended from Satan, you're not descended from the, the true seed that matters. And these are Jews he's talking about. So he's basically, I mean, what, what basically he's doing, let, let's put it like this. I mean, and these are the leaders of Israel. I mean, so I work at Wheaton College, you know, the, one of the pillars of evangelicalism, so they say, right? And, and it is. And God's been gracious and God's been faithful. But could you imagine if, like, they asked me to lead a devotional for the board of trustees and, and I say, okay, every head bow, you know, and, and if you want to receive Jesus tonight, because I know you all need to do that right now, <laughs> that's, then that's what John is doing. And if I'm a trustee member, I say, note to self, have parent fired, right? Because <laughs> that doesn't go down really well. And that's, that's what John is. That's, that's the political friction that, that's going on here. So um, John's doing that, and he's announcing this. Uh, this new exodus movement taking place in the desert. In order to get in, you have to convert. We know that by the end of the first century, if you were a Gentile converting to Judaism, here's what you'd have to do. You have to get wet. You have to dunk. Why? Or dunk or be sprinkled. It depends on whether you're Baptist or Presbyterian. All right. But you have to get wet. However, why, now, why is that? Because when you get wet, you're recapitulating the exodus. Just as the children of Israel had to go through the Red Sea, get between water... If you're going to come into Israel, you've got to relive that experience symbolically by getting wet. And John's baptism, of course, lays the basis for our baptism in Christ. So, so part of what John was saying is, I'm, conver- I'm reconverting Israel. God's looking for a fresh start. So this, is, this means this is a redemptive historical shift. You know, back when, when I was a, a pastor uh, in the 90s, in the Chicago area, there's this movement called the Promise Keepers Movement. Some of you might have participated in that. It was, it was just kind of like this revival thing, that, and, and God would do great things through that movement. Sometimes people look at what John the Baptist, Chap, Baptist is doing as like a kind of Promise Keepers Movement, and like I'm here to say, friends, it's much more profound than that. What he's saying is the moment has come for return from exile the one moment that, that Israel was looking forward to in history. And so he's baptizing, administering a, a, all this for the forgiveness of sins. And you got to say, stop, hit the pause button again. Because last time I checked, my Bible, if you want to be forgiven, where would you go? Where would you go if you want to be forgiven? You go to the priest who was parked at the temple. And now John's out in the desert, and he's offering forgiveness. He's the son of a priest. And if I'm a priest, I'm like saying, whoa, who gave him a license? And John's saying, I don't need a license. The temple's moving. The, 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 the place where forgiveness is happening, it's moving out of the brick and mortar uh, and where the temple is. And it's going to this new space, which Jesus will eventually occupy. So this new kingdom that's coming is this new worshiping reality that's started by John. So John is there. He's preaching, um, and people are confessing their sins. 
And uh, gosh, people are responding like crazy. But of course, Jesus respond, what happens with Jesus is unique. And John is setting up this new community. And we know from Matthew and Luke that he's calling for fruit. And if we went to Matthew and Luke, they would say, he would just say this, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Now, for many of us, when we think of fruit in the biblical context, our minds go right to Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit, you know, patience, self-control, all the things I struggle with. And that's not necessarily wrong. But let's look at it from a biblical theological point of view. When you look at fruit, when you look at the prophets who talk a lot about fruit. Isaiah talks a lot about fruit. And when he talks about fruit in Isaiah chapter 5, uh, he talks about social justice. Are the widows being taken care of? The single mothers, are they being taken care of? Are the orphans being taken care of? How are we handling the immigrants? Are they being taken care of? Though that's when the barometer of, of a society is how it takes care of the marginalized. And that's how you show fruit as a society. When the, society, when the power brokers aren't taking care of the marginalized and the disempowered, we got problems. And Israel had problems. And Israel was not bearing fruit. So John the Baptist says, hey, you can get baptized and all, but what it means is you need to bear fruit. And when they say what, and they, what they came to John and said, well, what do we have to do? You know the thing he doesn't say that's striking to me? He didn't say, work on your quiet time. He said, you know, if you got two tunics and someone else has none, you better give them one. And if you're extorting people, you better stop. Everything he talks about is related to money. Now, of course, piety is important to John. I'm not denying that. But what we can't do is, like, is just reduce piety to something on the inside. Like, like these issues of money and justice don't matter. They're connected like this, right? This, why is this so important to John? Because he, wants, he just wants everything to go well. No, because he knows you can't really be a worshiping community without a platform in place where justice is already happening. I mean, Jesus puts it this way in the Sermon on the Mount. Hey, if your brother has something against you, don't waste your time going to worship. First be reconciled to your brother. Then we can talk about worship. Get the horizontal straight, and it might be a process, but work on it, and then we can talk about worship. The vertical and horizontal hold together. You cannot separate them out. And if we're treating each other poorly in our communities and claim to be worshiping God, uh, we're lying. For John, they, they hold together. For the, for the Bible, it, it holds together. So this kingdom that we're talking about it's, it's not just about, it's, it is about individual relationship with God, but it's about this community that's coming together. Uh, and John's announcing it. Jesus obviously has a special place. Jesus begins his ministry in verse 14, and John was arrested. Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe this gospel. So when it says repent, it means do 180. You're going in the wrong direction, and in order to participate in this gospel, it means there is a moral code that goes along with it. There's standards in, in, in this kingdom. Now, Jesus talks about some of the standards in the parable of the sower, so we're going to go to there in Mark chapter 4. And so I'll read, this, I'll, I'll read the first nine verses. And he began to teach beside the sea... And a very large crowd gathered about him. So he got into a boat and sat on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them um, many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some fell along the, seed fell along the path. Actually, beside the path, better translation. And the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seed fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing, and yielded thirtyfold, sixtyfold, 
and a hundredfold. And he said to them, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. I mean, we, I think everyone in this room, if I were to bet, has heard this parable. But what's Jesus doing here? He begins to teach beside the sea. When you read the Gospel of Mark, pay attention to geography. We've already seen the phrase beside the sea a couple times in the Gospel of Mark. I skipped this, but when he calls his first disciples in Mark chapter 1, he calls them paratain philosin, beside the sea. When he prays about the, the apostles, he prays paratain philosin, beside the sea. When the disciples decided to join Jesus, they, they're giving up their fishing business. That's a major decision. When Jesus is calling the twelve, he is making a major decision. In the parable of the sower, he's confronting them with a major decision. On one level, that makes sense. I remember when I was taking a, cl a class as a freshman in college, and we were talking about the sea as an image. And the professor was remarking how sometimes when in literature, when the sea is in, um, used as an image, it represents a moment of decision because you're right at the edge of the land, right? I think it works that way for Mark, but the, my, my real proof in that is there's only one other place in the Greek Old Testament where paratanthalasin, beside the sea, occurs. And that's in Exodus chapter 14. When Moses is leading the people of the Red Sea, and, the, and then they look over their shoulder, and they see the clouds of dust getting kicked up over the horizon because Pharaoh's army's coming. And they're saying, it's only going to be a matter of time before they're here and we're dead. And they're hemmed in paratanthalasin beside the sea. And at that moment, Israel, the people of God has a decision to make. Will we trust God to deliver us at this moment beside the sea? Jesus is beside the sea giving this parable because it's a moment of decision. How are you going to respond to the parable? This is all part of the Exodus. Jesus is beside the sea at the very same way that Moses was beside the sea with his people, and he's going to sort out who his people are, who will follow him through this, the Red Sea into this Exodus movement by how people respond to the parable. You see? Very large crowd is gathered about him, and so he gets in the boat and he sits on the sea. Now, to me... That's really interesting, because, and when you look at it in the Greek, it's literally, it says he sat on the water. It doesn't say he sat on the boat, it says he sat on the water. And according to scripture, there's only one person who sits in the water, and that's God. God sits enthroned on the tide. God also moves on the water in the Exodus. And the whole crowd is right there. Again, the phrase, beside the sea. You see, they're at that exodus moment. And now he tells this parable. And here's, here's what it says. First he says, listen. If you were to translate the, the listen, akuate, into Hebrew, it would go something like this, shema. If you're Jewish... And you hear the word Shema, your mind goes to one thing. Shema Yisrael, Elohenu Elhad Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Jews of the first century would say the Shema once, twice, maybe three times a day. We're still kind of sorting that out. But this was the core confession of faith. The, the faith, core of the faith is that God, Yahweh, is one, and there's no other gods like him. Now, what was the point of the Shema? It was a way of saying, this is our unique creedal commitment, and this is, my, this is the prelude to the commitment I have to keep Torah. This is basically you know, what, what the Nicene Creed is to Christians, the Shema was to Jews. Now Jesus gives the Shema. Now, what does that mean? It means he is doing what Moses did. Moses confronted Israel and said, here's the basic creed. 
Hear, O Israel, listen to this. The Lord our God is one. Now here's the Torah. Jesus is now about to give the Torah contained in the parable of the sower. This is the parable of parables, I think, because you get this, you get it all. This is, it's all contained here. And it's all about listening and how well you listen or don't listen. A sower went out to sow, and he sowed some seed along beside the path. This is the same path, I think, that Isaiah was talking about. It's the path that's returned from exile. Now, when you, you try to make sense of this, you say, okay, I think I know who the sower is. It looks a lot like Jesus, because he's going out and preaching and sowing his word, and that preaching is getting different responses. And I think even Bol- Boltman does agree. So even Boltman gets many things wrong and heretical. Here he gets it right. Jesus is the sower. But who is the seed, or what is the seed? And here I think we really can't do better than to say this. As weird as it's going to sound, the seed is the word of God, but it's also people. And here's why I say that, is because once you ingest the word of God into your soul, it becomes you. And uh, when God works in us, there's this process where the word just takes over our life, and the, uh, and the distinction between ourselves as 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 something that's standing opposite from God, and the Word of God collapses, and we become walking words of God. And Judaism uses the word the same way. And, I can, and if you're interested, I can give you parallels um, from other texts. Paul does the same thing in Colossians when he talks about the seed of the gospel planted in you so that you might bear fruit. Okay, so the seed is simultaneously the Word that's sown, but the Word is ingested by people, and there's different responses. Uh, the first response is the seed beside, beside the path. Jesus later uh, interprets this as Satan coming along in the form of a bird and eating up the seed. So it doesn't even connect. Now, I don't know about you, but I experience this myself sometimes, where someone says, uh, and I say this as a preacher, someone says, so what was the sermon about? I go, um... Hold on, hold on, it's coming, wait, you know, wait, okay, I remember what I had for lunch, but, you know, and, and, and there's, there's a spiritual battle going on, and when it comes, I mean, what's going to happen here on Sunday morning and at, at Reverend Anderson's church is a spiritual battle for every heart that's sitting there. What Satan wants to do is disconnect the word from really hitting home. And it's not just information, man. That's what the Enlightenment says. What it is, is it's the spiritual reality. And you, every time we're exposed to the Word of God, uh, we're under a spiritual attack where Satan just wants to remove it so it doesn't hit home. Those people are beside the way, the way out of exile, meaning they will never get out of exile. Then others fell along, along rocky ground where it didn't have much soil. And immediately it sprang up and had no depth of soil. So when the sun roses, it wilts because it has no root. Ah, yes. Do you remember what happens when um, one day when, in Mark chapter 11, Jesus and Peter uh, get up early and the disciples and they're heading to Jerusalem and, and Jesus has cursed the fig tree and then the next day Peter says, uh, well, that fig tree you cursed, it's withered. Exorinthe, which is the same verb here. So, you say, well, when Jesus curses the fig tree and it withers, he's not doing it because he didn't get breakfast that morning and was ticked off at the fig tree. It's a parable. The fig tree is Israel. And, and we know this is because when he curses the fig tree, his next stop is the temple. And he starts flipping over the chairs and flipping over the tables to say this temple is about to be destroyed. And of course he was right. The fig tree, the cursed fig tree, is a symbol of what Jesus was about to do in the cleansing of the temple. They're mutually interpreting. The parable of the sower explains the withering of the fig tree. 
what, in the withering of Israel. What went wrong with Israel? Shallow soil. Think about it this way. We just looked at the baptism of Jesus and the baptism of the masses under John the Baptist. All right? And if you were there, you'd say, oh my gosh, you, you can't believe what's going on. People are just responding to John like no one's business. We've got John t-shirts. We've got John bumper stickers. The John podcasts are getting so many hits, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, people are downloading John's sermons, you know, and, and it's like a revival. It's just crazy. And, but you look up closely at Mark chapter 1. People get baptized for repentance, for forgiveness of sins. Uh, who? Mark says, all of Judea and Jerusalem. I mean, that's a lot of people. I would say that's a pretty high number, right? If you had that kind of turnout? All of Indianapolis was at your church that day. Pretty good, right? I'd say that's a high turnout. So, uh, yet nothing really happens. Jesus shows up, and the clouds burst apart, and a voice comes from heaven. You say, well, yeah, well, so that's Jesus. But here's my question to you. If all of Jerusalem and Judea went to get baptized for John for repentance, and they're so super excited, what happened between Mark 1 and Mark chapter 15 when they're all crying out for Jesus' crucifixion? What happened? The seed was not deep enough. Oh, it showed a lot of joy, showed a lot of enthusiasm up front. Oh, yeah, oh, we're with you, we're with you. Yep, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, and then the heat turns on, and I'm out of here. See how the, so the parable of the sower predicts what's going to happen? It's like, don't be fooled by all that enthusiasm. Don't be fooled. I mean, what we're looking for is fruit. What we're looking for is not your enthusiasm. That's great. But the real payoff is, are you bearing the fruit? There's a third category where the seed falls among the thorns, and it chokes it out. Mark interprets this, and he says, you know what? This is like the desire of wealth and the worries of the world. And, you know, friends, I confess, I stumble, right? Um, just like even this morning, somehow I had to let the dog out at 3 in the morning, go back to sleep, and then I just start thinking about stuff. Oh, I got to do this, got to do that. What's going to happen with this? And before I know it's 4 a.m., and I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know, and then, and then you get anxious about not falling asleep, and that makes things worse. And it's the worries of life, right? And Jesus warns against that, and he says, listen, what happens when you worry about good things or when you get infatuated with the pleasures? It has a way of choking out the word. And that's true. So what it means as believers, you have to be really, really attentive, not just to the word, but how am I doing at hearing? I mean, any fool can open up the Bible morning by morning, but it doesn't mean you're actually engaging it. I mean, it's, you know, I've gone through devotional times with God where, friends, I might as well be reading a phone book. Remember those? <laughs> And what, the, what I need to do is be aware and saying, it's not the question of do I have the Bible open, do I check the box, do I show up at church, how am I hearing? And if I'm letting things choke out, guess what? I'm not going to bear fruit. A couple of fascinating things about this parable. Oh, wait, let's, before we get to that, let's go to the fourth soil. So some seed beside the way, Satan gets it before anyone else could do anything, nothing happens, no fruit. Uh, other seed, you know, you see a plant for a while, so it looks like it's alive, but no fruit. Uh, third seed, falls among thorns. Great start. Oh, wait, here come the thorns, choking everything out. No fruit. Fourth seed. Thank God for the fourth seed. It falls on good soil. And in the Greek, it's the good earth or the good land. Remember the promise to Moses in Deuteronomy? I am bringing you into a good land. The fourth soil is the promised land. It's the good land. It's the Exodus mission accomplished. And we know that because it bears fruit. 
when you get into the land, it's not just Exodus accomplished, but it's what David dreamed of, of having all the land and all the tribes integrated under one rule. The fourth seed is the fulfillment of the Mosaic Covenant with coming into the land. It's the fulfillment of all God's people bearing fruit together as a unified confederation and fulfillment of the Davidic Covenant. But wait just one minute. Isaac's in here too. Because what it says, it says 30, 60, and 100 fold. A hundredfold harvest. You say, man, that, that's an amazing harvest. How does he do that? Is it possible? And then New Testament scholars spend their time talking about, oh, is this literally possible? You know, and, and I don't know the answer to that, but here's what I do know. Is there's only one other person in the Bible who got a hundredfold harvest, and that person is Isaac. When Isaac planted things, he got a hundredfold harvest, and that was a sign of the covenant blessing. When Jesus says this harvest is going to have a hundredfold, he's saying, guess who the new Isaac is? I'm the new Isaac. I'm the heir. It's all coming back to me. This harvest is for me. We, fruit bearers, were for Jesus. It's all going to Jesus. A couple other kind of implications about the parable of the sower that's just striking. One is this, is it broke all kinds of expectations for people who got it. A lot of people didn't get it. In fact, it says that they came to Jesus and said, huh? And Jesus said to you, has been given the mysteries of the kingdom. I'm going to give it to you. Why? Just because you asked me. Think of it. The, the thing, I mean, think what would it have been like to be there? Jesus is telling this story about seed and dirt, and you're like, some people are like, what? What's that dude talking about? And just say, I got better things to do. And you walk away. There must have been people like that, right? There must have been other people like, you know, I think he's got a point, but I don't have the time to talk to him about it. And then there's other people who said, I need to engage this man more. And I'm going to ask questions. Jesus takes the question askers and he works with the people who ask him questions. I think that's a wonderful principle of discipleship. We just completed a discipleship course in our church, and I, I challenged the people in the group to make disciples, to mentor somebody. Just get out there and just pour your life into somebody. And then the next question was, okay, well, who? And if Mark were in the room, he said, well, if you read my parable of the sower, look for people who are asking questions. You know, there's some people in life, they're not asking questions. Why? Because they already got all the answers, or so they think. They're not teachable. Don't, if you sow your seed on them, it's going to bounce right off. Wait for people to be in a position in life where they realize they don't have it all figured out. And so they start asking questions, and if you're there at the right time, they're going to come to you to get some answers as you share from the Word of God. Maybe you're in the place where you, you've just hit this new impasse and you say, I thought I had this figured out and now I'm asking a lot more questions. I need someone to disciple me. And that's fine too. But Jesus, I think this is Jesus' principle of when it comes to working with people and pouring your life into people, and I know a lot of you are leaders and you're always pouring your life into people, look for the question askers. Because that's, those are the people who are the best soil. And and you know what? God wants you to be good stewards of your seed. You, you can throw your seed on pavement if you want to. But what you want is fruit. Sow your seed strategically. Because you only got so much time in life. You only have so much energy. So look, look for that. Why this would have been shocking to the Jews is because they expected the Messiah when he would come. Is Messiah would come and just kick the Romans out, give them what they deserve, take over, and it would be clear-cut, bam, end of story. Game over for the Romans. And Mark gives us this parable of the sower that shows it's a lot more complicated than that. Because you have three sterile soils, none of which bear fruit, so they're obviously not being touched by the kingdom of God in a radical way. 
And then you have the fourth soil that is being touched by the kingdom of God. You have this kingdom reality that's taking shape, take, taking form, bearing fruit, but it's coexisting with these three other realities at the same time. And if you're a Jew and, and Jesus starts to explain to you the, the terms of the parable, you're like, how does that even work? Because I thought it was supposed to be bad, 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 kingdom comes, everything good. And Jesus says, not so fast. Here's what's happening in this kingdom calculus is bad, bad, bad will continue, but right alongside is this fruit-bearing reality. Now, on top of that, it's what Jesus, I think, is also saying is if you want to be part of the fourth soil, which I hope we all want to do, on some level, it's beyond your control because these are like just spheres of reality that only God can handle. But I still think the, the parable is a challenge to us to be good hearers. And if, if you want to be that good soil, what it means is taking a good look at yourself and good look at the first three soils and say, can I ride out those realities? First of all, when Satan comes to pluck that seed from me, am I ready to be aware of that and to fight that spiritually through prayer? When um, I have an enthusiastic response and then I'm being persecuted for my faith, Maybe in subtle ways, maybe in overt ways. I mean, persecution happens all over the world and happens in our context too, in different degrees. But make up your mind, how am I going to respond? When life is good and bank account gets pretty full and I can start throwing money around and I can start doing this and I can start doing that and, and I've got my man cave going and, and, and you know, it's all there. I'm truly in danger of that choking out the word. And I have to make up my mind ahead of time how I'm going to handle that. I think the point of the parable of the sower is these are all actually attributes, characteristic traits of the great tribulation that was every Jew knew was coming before the advent of the Messiah. Now, I don't want to step on any eschatological toes here or premillennial toes or postmillennial toes. This is not what I'm about. But sometimes people talk about the tribulation, you know, uh, pre, are you pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib? I don't want to get into that. What I do want to say is Jews believed in a tribulation, and it would happen right before Messiah came. Jesus is saying the tribulation is now. And it's going to manifest itself by Satan showing up at the door of believers, um, by persecution, and by materialism and worry. And these are all tests designed to, designed to sharpen us. It's like a big funnel where the seed goes down, and, but it's a funnel that has Velcro in it, and, and it's not all the seed makes it through the funnel, but the seed that does comes down on the good soil, and that's what's called the remnant. This is remnant theology. The path to the kingdom of God is a path through trials, and tribulations, <coughs> and even pleasurable things. But these are all part of the great tribulation. How Jesus was going to set up his kingdom wasn't like, oh yeah, there's this other stuff. It's through that stuff. It's through suffering that we're going to arrive. God uses all these things to shape us. So it's all part of the mystery, you see. We have to go to Mark chapter 8 and, and talk very briefly about what's going on here in Mark 8. Jesus, in Mark 8, 22, Jesus is at Bethsaida, and he heals a blind man. And it's an unusual miracle because Jesus is asking him, he says, well, what do you see? And he says, well, I see men, but they're like trees walking around. And then it looks like Jesus is saying, well, that didn't work real good. Let's try this again, <laughs> right? And, and, and then there's another blind man at the end of Mark chapter 10. And you're like, what's that all about? Well, right after this first healing of the blind man, we have um, Jesus at Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi is the heart of emperor worship. It's a major uh, center of emperor worship where the, the Caesar was literally worshipped. And there was also a, other pagan deities uh, who were worshipped. And it's interesting that Jesus declared Messiah on the mission frontier. Not in Jerusalem, but where mission happens. And Jesus elicits their disciples' opinions, and he says, 
who do people say I am? And they told him, well, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he says, but what about you? And Peter says, well, you are the Christ. And then verse 30 says, he strictly charged them, or he rebuked them uh, to tell nobody. And then he begins to give that, you know, that's the good news. Here comes the bad news. Verse 31, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days raised again. And he told them this plainly. Now, this is different from Mark chapter 4 because he told everything in parables. And now he's not doing parables. He's just saying this is the explicit deal. And what's interesting is after Jesus teaches parables and parable of the sower, he takes the disciples aside. And now it says, and Peter took Jesus aside. Jesus took the disciples aside to explain to them the meaning of the parable of the sower. Now it's Peter's turn to take Jesus aside and say, look, this is what the way it's going to be. Something's backwards here, friends. He took him aside and, and Peter began to rebuke him. And then, but Jesus isn't putting up with that. He's turning and seeing his disciples. He rebukes Peter. And so it's a rebuke fest here, right? So he rebukes the disciples. Peter rebukes him back, and he's going to have the last rebuke. And he said, get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind on the things of God and the things of man. And what there's, I think there's tons of things going on with that, which I'm not going to detain you with. But, but here's the thing. He then talks about, no sooner is Jesus declared Messiah, than he talks about the cross and about suffering. And what, pro- what does it gain you if you gain the whole world and yet lose your soul? And this is the gospel. So what's interesting here is the first eight chapters of Mark were spent trying to figure out who Jesus was. You know, in Mark chapter 1, Jesus in the synagogues, they say, who is this and what kind of authority does he bring? At the end of Mark chapter 4, Jesus stills the storm. And disciples, instead of asking him, they say to themselves, who is this guy? Now we get the answer. Right in the middle of Mark's gospel, it's the who is Jesus question. It's the Christology question. Now here's why this is important. We're only halfway through Mark's gospel, and we already know who know Jesus, Jesus is. Jesus is the Christ. He is the one on whom Israel's hopes are pinned. He is those seven figures I talked about, or the three figures and with the seven roles I talked about in my first lecture. All that kind of comes together for the disciples. They get it, but they don't. They're like that blind man who kind of saw, but kind of didn't. You see why Jesus performed that halfway miracle? As a symbol of what was going to happen when Peter saw The same thing happens to us when we convert, right? We get it, but we have so much to learn. We still have so much to learn. We're still, our eyes are still slowly being opened. And when you stop learning, well, where do you go? So so Jesus is saying, listen, this uh, this is the way it is. I'm going to suffer. Now, Peter starts to take over. He says, hey, I'm going to drive now, Jesus. Why don't you get in the passenger seat? And Jesus said, he's not putting up with that. He said, no, I'll be in the, pa- I'll be in the driver's seat. You can be in the passenger seat, and we're going to keep going on this Messiah drive. We figure out the first thing. First leg of the journey was figuring out who I am. There's a second leg, and what's, what's this going to mean? What is Jesus like? It's not enough to, figure, to say Jesus is the Messiah. It's not enough to get at Jesus' identity. Next question is, what is this Messiah like? How does he roll? He suffers. When I think about my experience of American evangelicalism, I see us obsessed with the first question, but hardly ever touch the second question. We think, hey, if you can fill in the the blank to the right answer of who Jesus is, you're good as gold. Jesus, Son of God, Jesus, Messiah, you're one of us now. Okay, so we don't even have to, you don't, don't even bother coming to Sunday school or whatever. You're good. <laughs> but now it's just getting going. Because now Jesus is saying, now I can start teaching you. Because the real hard stuff is what it means to follow me. And Mark 8, 9, and 10 is called the way section because the word way occurs, I think, six times. And Jesus talks about, he's on the way back to Jerusalem, but he's talking about the way of following him. It's the way of returning from exile, and it's always a way of suffering. 
We love to talk about who Jesus is. That's easy, though. We don't need, I mean, that, that's an important piece of information, but we need more than information. We need to see Jesus suffer so we can say, that's how I'm going to live my life. And that's the much harder decision. First, first eight chapters of Mark are pretty easy. The last eight chapters are really hard to live out. And somehow as a church, we've forgotten about the second half of the Gospel of Mark. So what happens? Jesus keeps heading to Jerusalem, and then in Mark chapter, um, t- at the end of Mark chapter 10, he runs on a blind Bartimaeus. I already talked about this. And as he came to Jericho, a blind Bartimaeus, is, and in my translation, the ESV, it says he's a beggar, son of Timaeus, and he's sitting by the roadside, but in the Greek it's by the way. And then after Jesus calls him, he follows him, uh, verse 52, on the way. He's getting on the way. That's the deal. Well, now Jesus comes in a triumphal entry. He enters in Jerusalem. And remember, the remit for Jesus was to clean up worship. And he goes, and the crowds are there, and they're shouting Hosanna. They're calling him the blessed da- the, uh, son of David. And they're right. But they don't know the other part of the deal. And he goes to the temple in verse 11. And he looked around at everything, and then he went back out. The problem is, is when Jesus goes to the temple, who should have been there? The temple leadership. And they should say, they should have been saying, here are the keys. You take over. But they don't even show up. You know, it's like a dignitary coming to town, and, you, and you're the mayor of the town, and you don't even bother showing. To let you, you want to let them know what you think of them. That's, I mean, Jesus is that dignitary coming to town. He's got a big parade in his honor. And the Jewish leader's saying, we're not even going to show. We're that uninterested. We're that unimpressed with this Jesus. Next day, Jesus comes back, and he cleanses the temple. Now, when you, when you see Jesus cleansing the temple, I mean, it's, it's a big deal. And if, if he stayed at it long enough, he probably would have been rested and crucified the next day because that's I mean that's Romans were on high alert because this is Passover Passover was like Israel's July 4th where they're saying yeah Israel's going to be free one day yeah what's going to happen just like with Moses and the Exodus that's what Passover is about it's like the holiday where you where you're looking to national aspirations and national independence and some guy comes in and starts flipping over tables in the temple I mean, the Romans knew enough about Jewish religion to say, we're going to be there, we're going to shut him down real fast. So I don't know how that worked in practice, but Jesus did it quickly and moved on and avoided the Romans, but the Jewish leaders saw what was happening, and they knew exactly what it meant, that this temple will be destroyed. There's different interpretations of the cleansing of the temple, uh, and and there are probably multiple interpretations, but in order to really understand what's going on, you have to acknowledge a couple things about the temple. One is the temple is obviously the nerve center of Israel's national worship. When he's saying this temple is being destroyed, it's not just, oh, I don't like this place. What it is is an indictment of those people who lead the temple, i.e. the high priest and his staff. Look at it this way. God only, in the Bible, God only allows Israel to be destroyed when what? When it's disobedient. If Jesus is saying this temple will be destroyed, it's not because the Romans are more powerful. It's ultimately because God said, I'm done with you guys. And if I'm done with you, he means I'm done with Caiaphas. So Caiaphas is connecting the dots, and he and his staff are saying, we've got to do something about this Jesus. Okay? Temple's a religious center. It's also an economic center. Josephus, if, if we believe Josephus, there's something like the equivalent in, in like today's U.S. dollars, something like, what is it, like $100 million holed up in the basement of the temple because it was the central bank of Israel. You didn't keep cash at home. You kept it safe at the, the temple. But here's the thing. The temple priests were also the accountants, and they cook the books. And you, when they passed the plate, this high priest would, before the plate went back to the temple, 
help themselves. In Jewish thought, when you steal from God's bank account, when you steal out of the offering plate, that becomes a desecrated space. You desecrate the, the temple space. When Jesus flips over the, the chairs and tables, he's saying, this is a desecrated space because the te- temple priests are stealing from God's people. Here's another way it worked. We'll talk a little bit more about this when we come to the Gospel of Luke in a few days. Let's just say you lived hand-to-mouth existence, paycheck to paycheck, which most of the, most of the population did. They were, they were agrarian, they were farmers. You get up in the morning, you go to work, they pay you at the end of the day, you stop and get supper, feed your family. You miss a day of work, they don't eat. That's how it worked. Well, if you owned your own farm and owned your own land, what happens if you have a crop failure? Well, how are you going to eat? Well, you get a loan. Where do you go to the loan? You go to the bank, in the basement of the temple. The priests are there. Oh, yeah, we can make you a loan. We'd be glad to help. 25% APR. If you're living hand-to-mouth existence, what are the ch- chances you're going to pay off a 25% APR loan? Very slim. And eventually, they foreclose on your land, and they own you. And we know this from Josephus. This is exactly what happened. The priests would own more and more land, and the people were basically slaves on their own land, their own patriarchal land. And the priests were getting fatter and fatter and fatter and wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. With, basically, they owned all the wealth. And when you have that, you have incredible amounts of power and leverage. And Jesus goes in and flips the tables. It's an economic point. He's, he, they, they, they were oppressing God's people. There's something else going on there. I'll talk about that more tomorrow. So the temple is an economic place. It's a religious place or a spiritual place. Um, it's also a military place uh, because there was a group named, named the Zealots, and these were the revolutionaries, and they wanted the Romans out so badly that they would meet at the temple with a view to planning assassinations or terrorist attacks. Uh, it was, they, were, they were just the disruptors, and they'd use violence to disrupt. Jesus was not a zealot. He, he didn't, wasn't behind the zealot program at all, uh, but this was their headquarters too. And I think the, the scribes and the Pharisees just looked the other way. So it was a military installation too. It's also where justice was administrated. You might look at it this way. Most of us in this room will remember exactly where we were when 9-11 happened. And what was 9-11 about? What was the symbolism of it? Well, there, what were they shoot, I mean, what were the buildings that were hit? The World Trade Center? The financial district, right? They were going for the Pentagon. They got the Pentagon. Um, what was the place out in Pennsylvania they were shooting for that didn't make it? Oh, the capital. Okay, so it's a political center. So the, the terrorists are looking at the economic center, the, uh, the military center, the political center. I mean, if they want to hit the religious center, I don't know what they like, hit Willow Creek. I don't know. Like, what, you know, what, what do you, but here's the point you take all those realities and you fold them into one, and you've got, got the temple. When Jesus says, rolls over the tables in the temple, he's saying, your military center, your political center, your economic center, your justice center, all these things, it's going to be wiped out. The whole backbone of Judaism is gone overnight. That got Jewish leaders pretty angry. And that explains a major explanation for how he ended up on a cross. But it also has implications for what Jesus' program is about. Jesus came promising a kingdom, and he's saying the kingdom you have in place isn't cutting it on all those levels. God is going to implement a new kingdom operating in just ways on all those levels. The fact that Jesus critiques the kingdom or the, the present kingdom of Israel on all those levels, which I, you can't avoid that conclusion, means that Jesus had other plans economically in terms of justice in terms of spirituality, the whole realm of human existence. So it's a really political act. Not politics the way the world does politics, 
But what it means is our vision of the kingdom has to touch on all these realities of life. It means we got work to do, right? Doing theology. We, got, we have got to look at our culture and look at the problems we're confronting and ask questions, come back to the Bible and say, how do the scriptures speak to these particular issues? Because if I'm a um, member of this kingdom, then I should expect the, the Bible to speak to those. And, and when the, what happens is with you know, our, our kids is if, we, if they start coming to the conclusion that our religion has nothing to say to the problems that they're facing, they'll check out. Because people want answers. And, what we, and the importance of like, doing this and the importance of ITS, and th- I'm not trying to do a commercial here, guys, but I'm just trying to say is I'm glad you're here tonight. I wish the seats were full because I think what the church needs most of all is to do their homework and to say, look, the answers are all right here, at least the start, the start of a framework for doing kingdom work. So Jesus has done all this. Uh, and then what he does is he takes the, 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 the leaders on um, in a uh, series of disputes, and then he meets um, with his disciples uh, over, over supper. And as he's having the supper, and in Mark 14, 22, as they're eating, he took bread, and after he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup, which he given thanks, and gave it to them, And they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. We could spend a whole course just on these verses. And every time we take the Lord's Supper, every time we do communion, we're recapitulating this. So they're eating, and Jesus took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it. And he's done this before. We didn't read about it, but he, he fed the crowds twice, the feeding the 5,000 and the feeding the 4,000. The exact same, not just the exact same words, but the exact same words and the exact same grammatical form. Taking, blessing, thanking. Jesus already had a dress rehearsal for this Last Supper when he sat down on the ground and fed the 5,000 and fed the 4,000. I think the purpose of those desert meals was to reveal himself as the Messiah. In the ancient world, it was the king's job to make sure people were taken care of, that the social cohesion was taken care of. Ultimately, that meant to make sure people got fed. Jesus was feeding the people to show he's the real king. And the feast that he was giving was a messianic feast. We'll talk more about that um, this weekend. But this all points forward to the Last Supper where he takes a piece of bread and if we reconstruct the Aramaic behind the Greek, it would go something like this. The, Greek, the Aramaic doesn't have a verb to be. So what he would have said in Aramaic, assuming he spoke Aramaic, is this bread, me. Broken. And I simply love that. For, I mean, one reason I love that is because when Jesus sang invites his disciples to eat this bread that's been broken. He's doing a couple things. In the first century, as best as we can tell, there was a practice called the Ephicomen. Leaving the Ephicomen aside at the Passover meal. Scholars dispute this, but most scholars will say this is a Passover meal that Jesus is having, yet he's retuning it and he's reframing it for his own purposes. I think he takes a piece of bread called the Ephicomen. What's the Ephicomen? It's the piece of bread left for the Messiah. Don't touch that. That's for the Messiah when he comes. Leave a chair for the Messiah and put a piece of bread there because when the Messiah comes, he'll want that. The piece of bread left for the Messiah was soon identified with the Messiah. So to talk about that piece of bread was to talk about the Messiah at the same time. That's the Messiah's bread. Became That's the Messiah. Jesus takes the bread said, this Ophicomen, this Messiah, that's me. Once you eat this bread, it means you agree. So when they eat the bread, they're agreeing that he's the Messiah. Now, they already kind of agreed at the transfiguration, but now they're really agreeing by ingesting it and they're owning it. But here's the other thing. It's not just the Messiah, it's broken Messiah. This bread is broken. Jesus is about to be broken in another couple hours. 
this is my life. It's a broken life. When you take the bread, I, th- I believe what, part of what's bound up in this deeply, richly symbolic act, next time you take the Lord's Supper, you're taking broken bread as a way of saying, Jesus, you la- lived a broken life for me. I want to participate in that brokenness. I'm, I'm in. I'm willing to be broken for the gospel's sake because that's what it means to be in the kingdom. So it's like a missionary calling, you see. Jesus broke himself for us for the sake of the kingdom mission. And when we take the bread, it's not like just feeling closer to Jesus. It's like saying, I'm in on this mission too. Break me if you have to, Lord. I'm in. And, you know, it would cost the disciples something like that. So, but then Jesus says, this is the blood of the, of the covenant poured out for, you, for many. He's referring to a couple different verses. One is Exodus 24, when Moses takes the blood of the covenant and he splashes on the people and he says, this is the blood of the covenant. Jesus, at the Last Supper, is recapitulating the, that covenant-making scene that Moses had after the Exodus. That was the moment that Israel as a nation was formed in Exodus 24, where Israel made a deal with God. We're your people, you're our God. Now Jesus is making a new covenant. He says, I'm your Moses, I've just, I'm about to lead a new exodus, and now when you take this bread, you're, you're basically saying, I'm in this new covenant reality. All of that implies. What is a covenant? A covenant is a contract with God. It's a group contract with God. When we take the Lord's Supper, we're saying, God, it's your kingdom, and I'm signaling my own participation in your kingdom. If you don't want to be in that kingdom, if, you, if you're not part of that mission, then just pass the bread next time. Here's the other thing he's referring to is, is um, Zechariah chapter 9, which, is, which Zechariah talks about the blood of the covenant as well. Zechariah is looking forward to this new covenant that the Messiah will put in place. So the Lord's Supper looks backwards to Moses, but looks forward to that time when the shepherd will come and destroy the wicked shepherds. There's a big cosmic battle between the bad shepherds and the good one, one good shepherd. Jesus has already launched that battle by in his battle with the Pharisees and with Caesar. So it's a polemic or it's an agonistic supper. We're in a battle, guys. Uh, we're part of something that's cosmic, something big, and it's not just, hey, sit on my couch, put my feet up. When you take the Lord's Supper, you're saying, I'm in on this battle. Jesus is also alluding to Isaiah chapter 53, which talks about the suffering servant. Uh, Where do we get this right in the verse? I have to remind myself. This is the blood of my covenant poured out for many. The phrase poured out for many. Remember, the suffering servant gave his life for many. The suffering servant is a redeeming figure. It's, It's through his atonement that Israel can return from exile. Jesus reveals himself now as that suffering servant figure through the Last Supper. So do you see what Jesus is doing? He's saying, this is what's going to define my community. It's going to be a community that's going to be, live out this new covenant, uh, just like Moses asked people to live out the covenant. Uh, it's, going to look, it's going to look forward to being participating in eschatological battle, uh, David, of course, had to fight his eschatological battles, and it's also going to be a return from exile reality. All these narratives are, are coming together. Jesus prays at Gethsemane. He's arrested, betrayed, uh, and then he appears before Caiaphas. Caiaphas confronts him, and, and Jesus is just silent. And then he finally asks him in verse 61 of 14, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments. Why? Because we have heard blasphemy, he said. What's simply fascinating about this is we have two high priests in the same room together. Jesus comes in Mark chapter 2. We skipped this. But a guy's led down through the roof, 
big scene, and he forgives the man's sins. And they're all sitting around. You remember what the question is? Well, that's what he says. But he says, why does, why does this man blaspheme? When he says, because he says, I'm, I'm forgiving sins. And says, why does he blaspheme? No one can forgive sins but God. They accuse him in their minds of blasphemy. Caiaphas says, you've blasphemed. When G- Caiaphas accuses Jesus of blaspheming, in fact, he's blaspheming, isn't he? Do you see the irony? So what Mark leaves us in a place is you've got these two high priests. Now you've got to choose. Which high priest are you going to back? Last, last chapter, Mark chapter 16, they think it's over. Jesus has been crucified as the king of the Jews. And what an awful crucifixion. You know, when, when they tortured Jesus, remember what they did? They put a crown of thorns on him. Painful. They put a purple robe on him. Why? Because purple was the color of royalty. And when Caesar gets thrown, you put a purple robe on him. And then they fall on their knees and they say, Hail, King of the Jews. They're having so much fun with Jesus. They're having a mock coronation with Jesus, right? Thorns, purple cloak, hailing him. Those are all components when the Roman emperor becomes king of what happens. You know what the great irony is? In the very act that Jesus is being crucified, he is becoming king. They were right. <laughs> then we come to the tomb. Mark chapter 16, where he, he ends up on, uh, where the women come. The men are long gone. And very early on the first day of the week, the sun had risen, and they went to the tomb. And they're saying to each other, who's going to roll away the stone? And, and they don't know what's going to go on. And then they see a young man, and of course he's an angel, and he says, don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth. He was crucified. He was risen. He's not here. See the place where they've laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. There you'll see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonished had seized them, Trembling and astonishment had seized them, for they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And I don't believe verse 9 to 16 is authentic, neither do most uh, text critics or New Testament scholars. Mark ends his gospel with this phrase, for they were scared. Seems pretty anticlimactic, right? Jesus, the women appear to the tomb, the angel appears, and you know what they decide to do? Let's just not tell anybody, because we're so terrified. And we didn't talk about this, but the huge irony here is Jesus, for most of the gospel, can't get people to shut up about him. He heals a leper, and he says, don't tell anyone about this, and he goes and tells everybody, and Jesus can't even come into town anymore. And then he said to the disciples, don't tell anybody. And then the demons are, uh, the demon is in the man in Mark chapter 1, and he says, come, be silent and come out of him. He tells the demons to shut up. And, and he's constantly telling people to shut up, and the demons said, shut up. Now the angel says to the women, go tell people. And what do they do? They shut up. <laughs> and why? It's because they were afraid. And we don't see the risen Jesus here like we do in the other Gospels. And you say, man, yeah, why, why would Mark want to end his gospel like that? I mean, it's this place like you don't, you're not even sure what's going on. It's, and they're afraid. And, and, and why Galilee? Well, Galilee was to the north. Galilee was the frontier of Gentile land. Galilee was the edge of the mission. Not Jerusalem. It's all happening on the mission front. You see, we want to keep things in Jerusalem all the time. Because mission makes us nervous, you know, being with people not like us makes us nervous. Taking risks makes us nervous. We just want to be comfortable. Let's stay in Jerusalem. He said, go to Galilee. Yeah, you're going to run to people you don't like. You're going to run to people who don't get you and you don't get them. But you've got to go to Galilee if you're going to follow me. And they go. Eventually, we know that because the gospel was written. 
But Mark ends the gospel on a note of failure because the disciples are gone. The women don't obey. The women were great throughout the gospel of Mark, but now they just they disobey. Everybody's failed. But we have the empty tomb, and Mark leaves us as readers with a decision. Yeah, you might have failed. You might have screwed up many times, just like the disciples did, just like Peter does, just like now the women do. But we have the empty tomb, and what are you going to do with it? How are you going to respond? And I think today that's the same question God has for us with the kingdom. Yeah, we sense our failure. We, like, we know well, we fail all the time. But it's almost like Mark saying, yeah, I, I get that. But come back to the empty tomb and decide, are you going to go to your galley? Get back on the horse and go to your galley and fulfill God's kingdom purposes for you. Mark doesn't answer the question. He leaves an open question for a reason, to leave the decision with us. You know, remember how I said Jesus always forces us to make a decision? Mark now left us with a decision. Are you going to go on, get on your mission or are you just going to shut up about Jesus? I'm going to pray for us. Lord, uh, thank you for your word. Thank you that you called us to this mission. And Father, we pray for your forgiveness for ways that uh, we go to all efforts to avoid being broken. And we know in our flesh we resist that. We resist in so many ways being put to work for you. But we want to take this opportunity now to give you permission to take over in our lives uh, to conform us to your kingdom purposes and broaden our vision for this kingdom. Lord, for my brothers and sisters here who aren't returning, I pray that you bless them as they go on their way. For the rest who are taking the course, that you would uh, come, bring us back refreshed in the morning as we get into Scripture uh, the next few days. And we pray this in your powerful name. Amen.